Okay. Welcome everyone to uh, this uh, series of the uh, Coastal Highway Route E39 project uh, webinars. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Paulus, who will uh, talk about his uh, work on early contractor involvement uh, approaches for public project owners. Uh, this recording will, uh, or this webinar will be recorded, uh, and um, <coughs> uh, your name will not appear in the recording unless you ask uh, questions. Uh, we will uh, allow uh, Paulus to uh, uh, present uh, his uh, work first, and then uh, we'll have a round of questions at the end. Uh, if you want me to uh, read up uh, any questions for you, uh, please just uh, write it in the uh, instant, instant message uh, uh, function in uh, Skype. Okay, Paulus, I'll leave it all up to you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to this webinar. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for, uh, so for the introduction. Uh, the title of the presentation is Early Contractor Involvement Approaches for Public Project Owners. And I'm Paulus Bewondum. So the outline of uh, the presentation will be like this. First, I will talk general about early contract involvement and what are the available approaches that are used internationally and in Norway. Then part two will be, I will talk more about competitive dialogue experience from Norway, what we have, what we have experienced while, while using competitive dialogue. Then part three will be about best value procurement. I will introduce you to the best value procurement and the different phases of the best value procurement. And I will also present the experience, some of the experiences from the Netherlands and from Norway pilot projects that we have. At the end, I will compare these two uh, competitive dialogue and best value procurement approaches and suggest for what kind of project situation, which approach is suitable. That will be part four. Then part one, first, what is early contractor involvement? I will give you a brief introduction of what is early contractor involvement. Then I will present some of the approaches that are available internationally and what we have used in Norway. And at, at the end, I will talk about the success factors of early contract involvement. First, what is it? Early contractor involvement, uh, what is it? Uh, traditionally, uh, contractors are involved in a project just to execute what's planned and designed by client and consultant. There are different defini definitions of early contract involvement internationally, but in this context, I define it as involving the contractor in early phase of a project. In some country, it is used as a specific method, but in this context, I use it as a concept instead. Early phase, there are several early phases of a project. During this, my pres this presentation, I use its early phase as a pre-construction phase of a project. So that it's, it will not, be, you will not be confused. When we talk about early contractor involvement, the main ambition is to bring construction knowledge and experience into pre-construction phase of projects. That is the main ambition of early contractor involvement. Then when is early contractor involvement actually beneficial? What are, in what conditions shall we use? Some of the, these are uh, from literature, so what I have found, when a project is very complex, then it's advisable to use, uh, to involve contractors early. And also when a project is full of uncertainty, then it's also advisable to use contractors' knowledge early to uh, clarify uncertainties in the project. Also, when a client has no in-house competence, in, it could be in describing the project or defining the project. Then it's possible, it's wise to involve the contractors and use their knowledge and express to use, to define the project. Also, uh, when a project 
needs for new and innovative solutions that have never been tried before. It's, it's advisable to involve contractors and advise them to use their knowledge in defining the project here as well. Also, at last, when a client doesn't know exactly what is needed, here it is also it's possible to use their knowledge. And I will present some of the advantages of early contractor involvement. First, it increases constructivity because the contractors consider in the designing and planning phase the constructivity of their solution before it's detailed designed. Also, it increases the implementation of new and innovative solutions. Since the client and the contractor sit and discuss together about the project before the execution phase, so they know the project, both the client and the contractor know the project better before the execution phase starts. The client and the, the contractor get to know each other before they start to work together, which increases the collaboration level when we come to the execution phase, which is also a big advantage when we come to later in the execution phase. There are example projects that early contract involvement uh, has increased the probability of delivering the project on time, on budget, and with high quality. There are several examples internationally that documented it was possible to achieve, but it's not general truth, truth that it will, it will be like this in every project. And also, uncertainty in a project can be identified in early phase. Then it's possible to decrease the conflict level in the late phase of the project if it's possible to identify the project. Uh, uncertainty and risks in early phase of the project, before, especially if it is happened before contract signing. Then I will explain some of the barriers of early contractor involvement. If early contractor involvement has all these advantages, why don't we use it on every project, on small and big projects? There are barriers that, especially when we think of public owners, public clients like Saturn Spivesen, there are barriers that uh, kind of stop, stop us from using it in every project. The first one is cultural change compared to traditional procurement approach. It's a different way of working compared to what we are used to. So it needs training and education to implement uh, or to use different early contract and development approaches. Also, it demands teamwork starting from early phase of the project, which we are not used to in the traditional way of working. And contracting practice is different from traditional project delivery methods. We don't have standards that, uh, that could be used. And also, we don't have uh, handbooks that can be used to how to uh, use its different ECI approaches, early contract and involvement approaches. And sometimes there is also lack of understanding of the concepts and its benefits. So we don't, we don't dare to try it. And we don't, as a public client, we don't dare to uh, try it uh, since we don't see the con its benefits. There are also public procurement laws that we should follow, both national and international uh, laws, that makes it a bit difficult. They are not, it's, not, it's not straightforward to involve contractors because they should be procured based on transparent and they should, all, all of them should be treated equally. So that makes it challenging, especially when we come to the procurement phase. It can be resource demanding, demanding in the start of the project. That's also the barriers to use it, especially if we think of using it on small projects, it might be very expensive in the procurement phase, even if it's possible to uh, procure, uh, execute projects on budget, on time and with high quality, but it will be demanding and expensive in the procurement phase. 
And uh, I want to explain here that uh, there are different models of early contract involvement. This is, I took this framework from Walker and Lior Walker, and they explain early contract and involvement in, in a project life cycle. At the top, we see the four phases of a project life cycle, starting from phase one, initial internal phase. Also, we have phase two with project definition and design, phase three, project, ex project execution phase, and we have phase four using disposal after the project is delivered to the client. And at the bottom, we see there are different models of early contractor involvement, depends on when the contractor is involved and how long the involvement has lasted. On one end, we see early contract involvement model one, when the contract involvement is only one time involvement and it can happen in any of these phases. On the other extreme end, we see ECI approach or model five, that is long time commitment of the contractor starting from initial phase and throughout the execution and delivery of the project. In this corner, we are talking about uh, like partnering and alliancing kind of project delivery models. Here we have the traditional design build uh, and uh, design build, build contract, and we have also design and construct contract, and also management contracting. So different early contract development models can be combined with this different contracting uh, contracting uh, models. In the middle, we see the decision gates from one to four. This is uh, how the project will be formed step by step. After initial phase, then uh, there is a decision gate to, before we go to the phase, phase two, project definition and disposal. And it continues like this until decision gate four, where we decide about the operation and maintenance of the project. So this is to explain that there is, uh, there is not only one model of early contractor involvement, there are different models of involving contractors early. The, the involvement can be very short, one-time involvement, only one phase, it could be medium, or it could also be long-term involvement, starting from initial phase of the project until we uh, hand over it to uh, use and disposal phase. So it's broad, broad area. I did intensive literature review as part of my PhD to identify which approaches are used internationally to involve contractors early. I have identified several approaches. I listed some of the, them here. And uh, if we go, for example, to Australia, it's common to involve contractors by using alliancing project delivery model approach six year. And if we go to US, they use they start to use mostly IPD integrated project delivery model. And partnering was developed in the US and it has been used to involve contractors early and now it is used uh, on several countries. In UK, Australia used a lot and also in some other countries, including Norway. We are using that. Also, uh, if you see best value procurement or best value approach, it was started in the US and used on several projects in the Netherlands. And in Norway, we are trying it on uh, 19 pilot projects recently. I will go in detail and explain uh, best value procurement later on in part two of my presentation. And also I will explain competitive dialogue procedure in detail. These are the two approaches that I studied in detail. Competitive dialogue pro uh, procurement procedure is introduced by European Union and it has been used uh, on several European countries to involve contractors in the early phase of the project. There are, there are several models, uh, approaches here, uh, but I will not go in detail of these approaches. 
our so studied uh, knowledge and bridge projects to see which approaches we are using actually to involve contractors so far what is the experience we have been knowledge and bridge projects before i go to uh, in detail to the two of the approaches so i studied 11 bridge projects started by basin bridge projects starting from 2003 until 2015 and these are the top at the top you see the different bridge projects that i have studied and here comes the list of approaches nine of them approach one to nine are implemented in the project in different level at different frequency or different uh, rate but the rest three uh, are recommended as potential approach for future projects uh, by interviewing so I used actually a document study and interview of for to identify approaches that we are using in Norway. So we see uh, a lot of approaches that are tried and uh, here we see different approaches are actually combined in a project. If you see uh, uh, the first bridge project, there are uh, seven approaches that are combined actually to involve contractors. So basically we see from these findings that several early contractor involvements can be implemented in a project and uh, to involve them in the early phase. And if I explain some of them, for example, a approach one is indirect approach. As I defined it in the beginning, I, I talked early, I defined early contractor involvements as uh, involvement of the contractor's knowledge and experience so they don't need to involve directly it's possible to use their knowledge as well indirectly it could be by using consultant or other the means is and also uh, information meeting was used also to some grade some in some projects it was used in the early phase of the project so that to consult them uh, regarding procurement uh, strategy of the project or pro contract forms of the project but in some cases it was used very late so it was not possible to involve them uh, fully it was used to some extent to uh, actually to inform them about the project so it can be used in different grade information meeting if it is used very early in the initial phase or in the design phase, then it's possible to use the contractor's knowledge early. Also, we have front-end partnering, partnering process, which is after contract signing, but also before the construction commences. It's kind of a bit late, but it's also, it was possible in some case projects to optimize the project solution. So these are some of the findings that I have, approaches that I have. Uh, I will not go in detail of all in all of them. And I evaluated these uh, twelve approaches that I have identified based on when they are implemented in the case projects. Actually, these are the approaches that I have identified. A one to A twelve. These are the same approaches here. A one A twelve, and I evaluate them when they are implemented and when they could have been implemented their potential. We, I used the same uh, project life cycle, A1 to A4, that I showed you in the beginning. And here the solid lines shows us when they, these approaches were actually used. And the dotted line shows us when they could have been used. So basically, uh, what we conclude from this uh, analysis is that most of the approaches are used and relatively late in the projects while they have the potential to be implemented or used earlier. If you see, for example, approach six, which is direct, direct contact with a specialist contractor in the front end of the project, it was used that in, just in the detail the engineering phase, in the case projectors, but it could have been used starting from initial phase. 
So the conclusion is that the approach, have these different approaches have high potential of being used earlier in the future projects. At the end, I will present some of the success factors of early contract involvement. Uh, that will bring, bring, bring me to the end of part one uh, presentation. The first success factor is uh, involving contractor in, uh, early enough is an uh, important thing when we think of early contractor involvement because if they are involved late after several major decisions are taken, then they don't their inputs can't be implemented in the project. At the same time, we should not involve them very early, especially in small and uh, small projects, because it will just increase the bureaucracy of uh, the procurement process and it doesn't give the value that we want. The other success factor is it's important important to think of uh, the risk when we think of early contractor involvement. The risk that should be transferred to the contractor should be manageable. Otherwise, early contractor involvement is new, as we said, and the, if the project risk is high in addition to that, then we, as a public land, we might not have enough uh, market that will be interested in the project. And also, uh, it's important to, especially uh, for public owners, to increase uh, competence in public procurement using ECI. As we said, it's a new way of working and it demands education and training for public uh, pro procure, pro procurers in order to do it accordingly. Because if you, do, if you do small mistakes under the process, it might create a big delay in the project and, and uh, the consequences will be high. Also, the contractors are obviously looking for profit and to earn money and they should be compensated for their contribution. Otherwise, they might not be willing to share their knowledge and uh, experience in the early phase if they are not compensated for that. So proper compensation format should be prepared which uh, which motivates them to contribute. And also the selection criteria can't be based on lost, lost price or based on price. Uh, one thing is it, uh, in the early phase, it's difficult to estimate the project price. So price can't only be used as a ground, but also some, some other soft criteria should be used and there should be high weightage on qualification because when we think of early contractor involvement, we are interested in their competence and the contractor's competence. So uh, the competence should be given high weightage here. At the end, trust is very important. If the contractor doesn't trust the client, then they might not be willing to share their knowledge. So the client should build a system that uh, shows him he will uh, uh, he will make make the information that we will get from the contractors will be confidential. On the other side also, the client should trust the contractors. Otherwise, it's difficult to give them all this responsibility. When we involve them early, they are getting more responsibility to design to make decisions. So it's it's uh, important to build trust on both sides. Otherwise, every contractor involvement doesn't work. That brings me to the end of part one of my presentation. Part two will be about competitive dialogue. First, I will give you a brief introduction about what is it. Then I will explain the different phases of competitive dialogue and I will present at the success factors of competitive dialogue based on the experiences we have from Norway. First, what is competitive dialogue? 
It's a procurement procedure introduced in 2004 by European Parliament for particularly complex contracts. It's flexible and enables a dialogue concerning all aspects of the contract with several pre-qualified contractors. And uh, in 2014, the condition to use the procedure was simplified by European Union Parliament. Following that, uh, in Norway also we simplified it and there are five conditions that could that's, uh, that should be fulfilled in order to use the procedure now. So it's not only for complex pro contracts, but there are specific conditions that should be fulfilled. Some of the advantages of competitive dialogue are the client can have a dialogue phase about the project to discuss all aspects of the project with pre-qualified and short-listed contractors before contract signing. It has also a disadvantage. It's expensive when you come to the procurement phase relatively high transaction costs. And after I studied several uh, projects, I have identified these five phases of uh, competitive dialogue procedure. It starts with preparation phase uh, before the contract and involvement where the client needs and priorities will be clarified, followed by pre-qualification phase. Those who have applied will be pre-qualified in this phase. Then comes the core of the whole process, the dialogue phase. This is when the project gets developed based on the dialogue between the client and the contractor. And at least three contractors should be involved in this phase in order to have enough market or enough competition because the evaluation phase is coming later on. And the evaluation phase will be phase four. The evaluation will be based on most economical advantages tender. And the winner contractor, the one has got the one has the hat, that has got lowest price lowest competitive price will go to the execution phase. Only one contractor go to the execution phase. I will explain these phases step by step later on. First, preparation phase. What are the major activities in this phase? The major activities in this phase are uh, the client prepare tender document, and plan for the dialogue, dialogue frame, the client prepares that one, and check the market if there is enough market for such kind of project, because it's important to see if there is enough market for the project instead of repeating the procurement process several times. Then phase two is pre-qualification. In this phase, the client announces the project and Contractor submits their pre-qualification document, and then comes uh, the client evaluates the pre-qualification documents and shortlists shortlist the uh, pre-qualified ones and invite, invites them to the dialogue phase. Phase three. The major activities in this phase are the client distributes the draft tender document and. They prepare the contractor prepares sketch proposals. They get feedback from the client based on the proposal, develop the project further, and uh, prepare um, more detailed and better solution. Come back to the dialogue meeting too, and they also get feedback from that phase and go back and develop further. And then it can continue until the client uh, gets. Uh, enough uh, satisfying solution. So this is the core of uh, the whole process and there, there should be parallel dialogue meeting between the several contractors.
When the dialog phase is over, then comes the evaluation and selection phase. Then the client handouts further develops the tender document and how it handouts the uh, final tender document and contractor prepare uh, their offer based on this uh, uh, final tender. And also the client evaluates based on uh, they, uh, their tender document based on most economical advantages tender and award contract to the lowest one. I will show you one example how uh, the mo most economical advantage, advantages tender criteria was used in one of the case projects I studied. In this case, the client has decided to use 270 million Norwegian Krona as fictive price and, and uh, defined four criteria, soft criteria to evaluate the contractors and divided this 270 million into these four criteria based on the weights, the importance of these criteria to the project. Then we calculate the competitive price based on the tender prices, the price offer from the contractor minus the submission of these criteria weights. So the top uh, contractor could go could get 270 million as a deduction from his price, then he can win the project. This is one example. There are several ways of using this uh, soft criteria and using the uh, com com uh, competitive calculated competitive price. This is one example. Then the winner go to the execution phase of the project. Uh, as part of my PhD, I studied six, six projects that have used competitive dialogue and I developed this framework that illustrates how it is possible to uh, you know, use competitive dialogue in different phases of the project. And uh, the first model is without competitive dialogue, just design build contract. It's here just to illustrate uh, to, to use it as a reference. Then we have model two. It was used, uh, the dialogue phase was in the pre engineering phase, followed by design build contract. The other model is the dialogue phase was in the development of concept, followed by design build contract and operation and maintenance responsibility. And also we here we see model four, even earlier involvement of the contractor. Then the dialogue phase was in the feasibility study and followed by design contract. So the conclusion from this framework that I developed is competitive dialogue is quite flexible procedure that can be used on several early phases of a project. It can be used in the pre-engineering phase, in the development of concept phase even the feasibility phase. So, and it can be combined with different contract forms, design, design contract, design build contract, or it can also be combined with operation and maintenance. This is what the framework uh, tells us. And I will explain some of the success factors of competitive dialogue based on for, uh, from the experiences we had from Norway. The most important thing is to keep keeping confidentiality in the dialogue phase is very important. As you said, the dialogue phase is the core of the whole process and the clients will have several parallel dialogue phase uh, meetings with several contractors and the client should have a clear plan that shows how he will keep the confidentiality so that he will not share the one's contra one contractor's uh, solution with other. That gives the contractors also motivation to, to open themselves up and share their solution more with the client. 
to answer the success factor is involving necessary expertise at appropriate time. This is also in the dialogue phase. This is a phase where when the project get developed and there are several decisions that should be taken during this phase. It could be about geotechnical, about the zoning plan or other decisions will be taken here. Now it's important that the client involve necessary expertise during this phase, in the, the dialogue phase at different meetings to make these uh, decisions based on uh, expertise. The other one is standardizing, standardizing the evaluation process. So far, it has not been standardized and the different evaluation process were used in different projects. This has uh, created to some extent uh, transparency problem. So the client can use it as he wants so far, but it should be standardized in the future so that to create, the, to avoid uh, this transparency problem in the evaluation process. The other one is using the project in early phase of a project. The whole idea behind competitive dialogue is to give contractors more flexibility, but if they are coming late in the project, so they don't get the flexibility that is intended by the client. So it is much better to use it while there is enough freedom. Use of more function description is also the other success factor. Still, if we de describe the task in detail, then it's, it's not possible to optimize the solution. But if it's function-based description, then the contractor gets still the possibility to uh, they get the room for maneuver. And at last, it's important to have enough time for the dialogue phase because this is a phase that the project gets developed. A lot of important decisions of the project will be taken. That brings me to the end of part two of my presentation. And part three will be about best value procurement. First, I will introduce you to best value procurement. Then I will explain the major phases of best value procurement and explain success factors of the approach based on the experience from, from the Netherlands and from Norway. First, what is best value procurement? Actually, it is a performance-based procurement system developed by Dr. Dean Kashwagi in 1991 in Arizona State University. And uh, it's a selection process that can be used by owner. Sometimes it's also called as performance information procurement system. PIPS, it refers to the same thing, best value procurement. One thing I want to say is that there, are, there is a philosophy behind the method and it's also based on information measurement theory. I don't have the time to go to the philosophy of the method, but I will explain just the, the procedure around the method of the, the phases of this approach. It is a selection method based on past performance, qualification and price. There are 19 pilot projects that uh, are trying this approach in Norway. Several uh, projects have uh, used it in the Netherlands. Best value procurement has uh, these four phases that start from phase zero, because this is optional phase. Requalification is optional in best value procurement. Uh, and also it happens before the contract involvement. Then comes the selection phase where all vendors, all contractors can submit their uh, offer. 
the third phase is clarification phase. Only one contractor clarify the scope of the, the project to the client. And if the client accepts his clarification, the contractor goes to the execution phase. I will explain these four phases later on in the next slides. First, the pre-qualification phase. As I said, it's optional phase. If the client and uh, the contractor have expressed results, they can uh, jump over this phase. But the major activities in this phase are education of best value approach, especially if it is new for the client and the contractor. And the topics in this education phase should be change in paradigm because it's new way of working and how to succeed use of metrics it's the whole concept is based on use of metrics so there should be a education how to use it for both the client and contractor and also this process details the four phases of the the procurement procedure should be the focus and it's not recommended to use pre-qualification but if it is used then it's advisable to keep it minimum like financial, legal, and company standards could be the requirement to qualify. When we come to the selection phase, uh, these are selection criteria that should be used. First, level of expertise. That is, uh, what kind of uh, past experience or past performance the client has with similar kind of project should be evaluated. And this is recommended weights. It's possible to change these weights, but the selection criteria are fixed. It's not possible to change from project to project. But the first one is the level of expertise. The contractor past performance should be evaluated on this first selection criteria. And the second one is risk assessment. That is the client's ability to assess the, the project risk. Here the focus should be the client's risk, not the contractor's own risk. If they are able to identify the project risk properly, then they get the high score. The third uh, selection criteria is value added. What kind of additional value the contractor can give to the contractor, to the client within the given budget? That is the third selection criteria. And also comes the interview. Interview of two or three key persons from the contractor. Very short interview will be evaluated. And price comes as fifth selection criteria and it's recommended to use high weightage on the qualification on criteria one to four and price should be relatively low and the content from the uh, contractors uh, offer should be simple and not technical because there is the core concept behind best value procurement is the contractors are experts in their, what they are doing and the client is not expert. That is the whole uh, concept behind best value procurement. And also uh, the content should be project specific. When they deliver their level of expertise, they should not talk more about their general things, but they should talk about their project specific. Yes. And also, it should be based on center on performance metrics. They should have a matrix that shows in how many projects they have achieved what they have achieved. Then uh, comes uh, uh, when we talk about the uh, selection phase, it has three filters. The first filter is project capability submittal. The contractor submit uh, 
two pages of level of expertise, two A4 page, and two pages of risk assessment plan, and two pages of value added plan, six pages of documents they will submit, plus price. All contractors can submit this document. And the, the clients evaluate these uh, documents and call the shortlisted contractors to interview. Individual interview, maximum 30 minutes duration. And if uh, after evaluating the interview and the project submittal, the capital submittal, then the client verify uh, and prioritize the winner. This is a solid filter. filter. Verify if the documents are correct, what the, all the documents uh, were correct. Then comes the third phase, clarification. And in this phase, it's the contractors who lead and explain in detail the scope of their pro uh, proposal. And uh, they should present detailed and milestone schedule. And also risk uh, item and risk mitigation is a focus during this clarification phase. Basically, the procurement phase is not over, so they should not start to do work in this phase. And also, it is a clarification phase, so it's important to focus on that. There should not be negotiation on the clarification phase because of, uh, the procurement is not over yet. Then the winner contractor go to the execution phase. The important thing in this phase is a weekly risk report where the vendor uh, contractor track deviation from the project plan. This is a, these are the four phases of based value procurement. And I will explain some of the success factors based on my finding from the Netherlands and from Norway projects. The important thing in best value procurement is setting clear over, overall project goals is the most important thing that will be defined in the preparation phase. And it will be, these goals will be used on uh, clarification phase, selection phase, and in the execution phase as well. So uh, it's important to uh, assign enough time to define these goals, the project goals. And also allocating a realistic budget is important. Uh, if the, the budget, budget is not realistic, then the contractors can't give uh, real, uh, realistic uh, project as well. So there should be uh, a way to uh, calculate the realistic budget of the project. Also, it's important to have a visionary leader that have the get to start the, uh, to use the pro uh, best value procurement in his project and to push it in all phases of the project. As you said, it's new, so uh, uh, there might be a lot of problems under the, under the process. So it's important to have a visionary leader that can uh, see the end result and push, it, uh, push the process. Also, it's important to follow the phases and the philosophy piece of the method. The philosophy is that the contractors are the expert, they should get the freedom, as the client is not the expert. They should, he should give them more freedom to use their expertise. Also, when we come to the clarification phase, it's important to choose persons that have soft skills. That especially, it's sometimes it's difficult to see if the client and the contractors are negotiating or if they are clarifying the task. So it's important to have persons that interpret the philosophy and the method in a project context. 
and transparent selection is also very important. This can be uh, the contractors can contribute uh, to transparent selection by giving dominant metrics that shows their performance. Then it decreases the client's decision making. Then uh, that brings me to the end of part three of my presentation. Part four will be comparing these two approaches, competitive dialogue and best value procurement. I presented the phases and the success factors of these two approaches. And at the end, I selected some uh, comparison factors. Here we see some uh, factors and compare them. Which one is uh, and uh, I will explain some of these uh, comparison factors. If we take, for example, uh, comparison factor number four, number of competitors that develop a project, competitive dialogue, at least three contractors should be involved in the, uh, to develop the project because the evaluation phase comes later on. The selection phase come later on, but in best value procurement, the selection happens earlier, and the uh, project you will be developed in the clarification phase. So only one uh, contractor will develop the project. It has uh, significant uh, impact on uh, on uh, resource demand for both for the client and the contractors. And uh, if we see, for example, the comparison factor seven that I have uh, identified, uh, client resource need, it's demanding, competitive dialogue is demanding, but based by the procurement is less demanding. I have more comparison factors here. I will explain just the last one, number 17. That is an interesting one, I think. In what situation is approach suitable? Uh, competitive dialogue is suitable if a client wants to choose a supplier based on their solution for a specific project. So if, if, if a, a client is interested to see the solutions of three, four contractors and to choose them based on their solution, then it's best to go for competitive dialogue. But if the client is looking for an expert who has done relevant projects several times with high performance, so if the client is not interested in the solution but on the perform from previous performance of the contractor, then it's best to go to best value procurement. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I have five minutes for the question. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Paulus, for uh, a really nice presentation. Uh, I think we'll open up for questions, anyone? Seems that everything was perfectly clear. Uh, my, I have uh, one question uh, you know, regarding uh the uh, you know how do you see early contractor involvement uh in you know infrastructure projects with the uh, uh, thoughts of the uh, practice that we have with political approval uh coming rather or the, you know the final uh, political approval coming rather late in the uh uh, planning stage of, uh, of yeah. project when uh, often when the detailed uh, area land use plan is uh, determined and uh, a lot of other uh, mm. things are already defined. Yeah, the, that is a, actually the challenge not to involve the air contractors very early uh, because uh, as you said uh, there are a lot of decisions that will be done lately and affect the freedom. 
but uh, it's also important to uh, when we think of early contract involvement to see the the political processes as well. Uh, it's uh, it's possible to see, uh, for example, the freedom certain swipers and have co compared to uh, uh, nearby. So it has significant meaning on how flexible they could be based on the political freedom they have. So uh, it's not only the wish of the involving contractor, but the political process should also let the contribution not affect the, the decision making later on. I have, uh, I have also uh, seen uh, some expressions from Helgeland project, how the zoning plan was kind of uh, they have used competitive dialogue to involve contractors uh, before the uh, yeah, after the zoning plan was approved. It has limited their uh, freedom, the contractors' freedom. So they were supposed to replan the zoning plan, which has created a significant effect on the project execution phase. So uh, the political process is uh, also important, as you said. Thank you. Can I ask one question, Matthias? Yeah, sure. Good. Uh, Samson, uh, my name is Samson, by the director. Thank you for a very nice uh, uh, presentation and the clear work. Uh, my question is not just on the work, but uh, gender, it could be just an, an advice uh, or uh, your opinion. Uh, it is obviously an advantage to have early contract uh, involvement. But uh, there is also a need to for the client to set a budget uh, to convince the people who are going to use it and so on. That needs some level of detailing. Mm -hmm. and then uh, that budget is already fixed. Mm -hmm. And then when you involve the new uh, the contractors, would you be hoping that they would come with a better solution that would be cheaper or how would that be assessed? Mm -hmm. you, if you understand my question, yeah, yeah. Uh, Just when, to, keep the, to keep the balance between uh, uh, letting them do the impact, the contractors, yeah. Yeah. and at the same time have some predictability from the client and uh, other uh, interested parties. Yeah. How do you think that would be? Thank you. Uh, thank you for interesting question. Uh, when it comes to the project. Uh, uh, cost and estimate. There are different ways of doing this. Uh, it's in some early contract involvement approach. It's possible to, to use target cost contract or guaranteed maximum price approaches, so that the client and the contractor agree on on some target cost contract to achieve, and they should not uh, they should not work on to, to on the estimate of the project early, but they just set a target. If they have achieved the target cost, they, they, uh, or if they manage to go below the target cost, they, they share the uh, benefit. And if they go uh, above the target cost, then they share also the uh, lost. So there are arrangements, or it's also possible to use maximum guarantee maximum price arrangement. That uh, in a way facilitates that the project cost will not uh, exceed uh, from the estimated. So some way gives the guarantee to the client to have control on the cost. There are, there are several approaches that are tried when it comes to the compensation format, and it's also important to have these compensation formats in the execution phase to keep the collaboration level high and motivated all the time also to use uh, the development in the execution phase as well, not only in the early phase. Because mostly the development stops in the after the contract signing, which is not uh, what we intend to. The development of the project should continue in the execution phase as well. In that case, in order to motivate both the contractor and the client, there should be a uh, composition format that motivates them. That could be uh, pension, gear share arrangements that could motivate for collaboration. Thank you. 
Okay, we're still a little bit over, but uh, we have uh, one question here that I'll read up uh, before we we finish. Um, the question is: Have you re revealed any obstacles with public procurement and early involvement of contractors? Yeah. Uh... So far, there is no uh, failed case, but uh, if it's not done properly, especially during the co confidentiality, uh, then it could case it could create a big problem. Uh, if you if you take for example the uh, best value procurement or contact dialogue, if the confidentiality is not uh, given enough attention during the dialogue phase. And if the client to start to share uh, things which he should not, then it will uh, create problem. Other obstacle could be to yeah, to treat all contractors equally. But if as far as the client has a clear plan for that, and as far as the client is transparent through that process, so it should not be an obstacle. It's possible to do it, but. It, as I said, it's important to have knowledge about the, the procurement procedures and education about the procedure. So they are not real obstacles, but the clients should be careful more on these tasks in this area. Thank you. Uh, in this case, uh, I see it's uh, a little bit over 11 o'clock, so uh, I think uh, if any of you have any further questions, uh, please just direct them uh, direct to, directly to uh, Paulus. Uh, if you don't have his contact information, uh, contact me or Chasti and uh, uh, we'll uh, forward the question. Uh, then, just leaves me to say thank you so much for uh, listening in on this uh, webinar. I will now stop the recording.